Welcome to another episode of American, American Timelines. Time I'm Amy. And I'm Grover. Nope, Steamer. nope, nope. That's Joe. I'm Joe. And, and we are a, a beautiful married couple. And this is the first episode of our 1980s series. 19. Season two. This is season two. The 80s. Yes, the beautiful totally 80s. 80s. And, and we've is, been together yep. for 20 years. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> just, I'm just saying. So if people notice a lot of tension between us what it's all amy's fault wait a minute no, where did that come from <laughs> it came out of the blue no, uh, it was out of the blue wasn't it yeah um no um no i think uh, we just get a lot of listener mail people <laughs> ask us like hey how long have you been together anyway uh, what's what size what's your inseam size yeah they do and it's a so big hot topic in big the, hot topic, on the yeah. street so anyway we've got 10 episodes in the books. in the can That's season right. one is over that was the 90s and um as we mentioned we we're learning. We were using the 90s as our, let's figure out how to do a podcast. Let's organize it a little bit. Let's see how it goes. And because it's called American Timelines, we're actually, this is, we're going to try something different. We're going to try to actually put everything in order uh, from the beginning of the year to the yes. end of the year. And we'll see if it. So we don't have to sit through 20 minutes of wrestling. Yeah. Because Amy got sick of all the sports, sports stuff wrestling. all at once. Let's sprinkle it around. So I said, oh, let's do chronology then. Let's see if that works. Let's smear it, smear it all around like. Feces. So we'll All just, right. So, what happened in 1980? We're going to start at the beginning of the year, January 4th. Yep. The number one hit song as we rang in the new year on the Billboard charts was Rupert Rupert Holmes. Uh huh. You are familiar with him? Nope. He sang Escape, the Pina Colada song. Oh, if you know P, or if you like Pina, Pina Coladas. Coladas. That's right. Getting caught, caught in, in the, the rain. rain. Yep. So have you ever paid attention to the lyrics of this yeah, song? Yeah, it's bizarre. Well, it's not that, I mean, what do, you, do you know what it's about? Yeah, it's like he makes, he sends, a, puts a personal ad in and his lady puts a personal ad in and then they end up answering meeting, each other's personal ad. Meeting each other and it was all about Is Pina Colada. my own lovely lady. Oh, I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize what that was about at all. All I've it's, ever listened to is that. It's so stupid. The, so that's what I, that was a big story that I had was, I didn't know that's what it was about. Yeah, it's a really ridiculous song. But then at the end they realize, hey, we both like Pina Colada, so let's forget all our differences and. It, uh, and quit cheating on each yeah, other with personal ads. Yeah, I, uh, I'm. I'll forgive you for sleeping with Jerry yeah, because right. uh, uh, we like pina coladas. So then they just got drunk. That's um, right. Okay. Well, that's cool. I didn't know that anybody knew that. It's not really I, cool. It's not really cool. I mean, it's, it's cool of... that you knew that. Oh, okay. But if you go on YouTube and search the song, the yeah. first, <laughs> the first, the first video that comes up on YouTube right now is uh, a video on. I think it's like on Soul Train or something, and. Uh, the village people actually introduce Rupert Holmes. Oh my god! <laughs> and, all, and then Rupert Holmes comes out and sings, and he's wearing. He's, he's your typical '80s guy, like wearing those glasses that turn dark. Blue blockers. Like, they're not quite blue. They're like the ones that like they're glasses, but then the sun they get kind of dark. Amber vision or like something. Amber vision. He's got a beard, like a yeah. crappy '80s beard, and he's wearing a he's wearing like a jacket with the a sleeves yipe. pulled up, kind of thing. Yeah, like just like like your typical '80s. Douche, douchebag douche bag guy yep. yeah like oh, poor 80s uh, well, so 80s anyway were rough. that's, that's cool fashion. that you remembered what that song how that goes so that was number one going into january from december 22nd and into 79 into 80 it's a perfect transition to the yeah. 80s is that yeah because song. 80s was all about that kind of crap that kind of like the 80s was in my opinion and, 80s was the worst for fashion it's it's just like you said the before, ugliest it's fashion. white trash and the it's, 80s is the yeah. whitest trashest of the and it's you know it's just it's all about it was like the me decade, you know, and it was all about uh, living fast, dying young, and all that stuff. So yeah, a it's got a, ba- a real different feel from the 90s. Cocaine. Lots of coke. Lots uh, of chicks. A lot of feathered hair. Lots of chapstick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so bubblegummy. Like everybody had yeah. bubblegum, it seemed like. I don't know. It's so. Yeah. It's such a weird time. It was. Um, January 16th, Paul McCartney was arrested and jailed on drug charges. Oh. Do you, you ever nope. hear about this? I've never heard about this. Nope. In Tokyo. Okay. Um, he landed at, at Tokyo's Narita Airport with the rest of his band Wings oh. and his wife Linda and their four children. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to a short tour of the country where the drugs were found in his suitcase, 
Uh, customs officials discovered nearly eight ounces of marijuana in McCartney's belongings at a time when possession of that amount could be punished with a sentence of seven years hard labor. Oh, my God. In Japan. So he was arrested, handcuffed, and questioned for an hour by narcotics officers who then transferred him to the local jail while his family and band members were placed in a hotel. Uh, <laughs> Japanese authorities held him there while they decided what to do with him. After nine days, he was finally released without charge and deported to England. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 11 concerts that the Wings were expected to play were canceled. McCartney had been in- introduced to marijuana in a New York hotel room uh, by Bob Dylan in 1964, Sweet. along with the rest of the Beatles. Yeah. So isn't that cool? Yeah. Bob Dylan taught the Beatles how to smoke weed. Yep. Called Prisoner 22. McCartney was given no special treatment in jail. He had to work out for himself. That Wait, he was, he was jailed? I thought they held him. He was in jail for nine days. Oh, he was? Yeah. Oh, I missed that part. Yeah, and while he was in jail, he was not allowed to wash and brush his teeth each morning until he had swept his cell and folded his bedding. So that incident led to the wings breaking up. Oh, it did? Yeah. Okay, they were pissed. Yep, see you later. January 19th, Michael Jackson's Rock With You was the number one song from January 19th to February 15th, and it was considered one of the last hits of the disco era. Okay. Rock with you Mm -hmm. all night. I always forget Michael Jackson sings that. That's true. January 20th was Super Bowl fourteen. Oh, boy. You're going to ask me the cost of a Super Bowl ad. Yeah, oh yeah, and this is going to be hard to get. It's going to be hard because I have to million, subtract. Subtract 20 years. Go back 20 years from the last one, 19 years. Jeez. Okay, first, the Steelers beat the Rams 31 to 19. Terry Bradshaw was the MVP. Mm-hmm. Do you want to guess who sang the national anthem? 1980? Yeah. Shaka Khan? Oh, that's a good guess. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think, I want to see a little later. It was Cheryl Ladd. Cheryl Ladd? Yeah. I didn't know she was a singer. I, I guess that rings a faint bell. Like, I, she was a singer. I don't. What else? Well, she's an actress, too. She was a model. Charlie's Angel. Oh, that's right. She was a Charlie's yeah, Angel. Yeah, baby. And Cheryl Ladd. her, her father Cheryl. was Alan Ladd. He was a, a producer. Oh. She Cheryl was Chris, Ladd. the blonde one. But she was a replacement angel, right? Yeah, she took Farrah's place. I know everything about the Charlie's Angels. So Farrah Fawcett left. And the, so Cheryl Ladd was like She Vance was Jill and Monroe's Duke. sister. Chris Monroe. She was her younger sister was the storyline on the Charlie's Angels. Yeah. You're, is this you how, are you, is this how to, you feel when I talk about wrestling? Yes, and you're going to have to oh endure God. lots of oh Charlie's Angels discussions in the 70s, but so get Cheryl, ready. Wouldn't Cheryl Ladd be like the Vance and Coy of the Duke boys? No. she like was Because Farrah was only on the Charlie's Angels for like two two seasons. So it didn't fall apart. And then Cheryl, Cheryl Ladd left? came. Yeah, no, not at all. And then Cheryl sure? Ladd came on, and it was on for a couple, like four or five more seasons. Are you sure it wasn't just you that liked it? No, but I did love it. My cousin and my friend Joy and I would play Charlie's Angels all the time. Yeah, I know I've heard that. At length, and the and the podcast <laughs> listeners don't give a shit. About All that. right, uh, but do you, so you don't remember when you were like eight years old, her singing the national anthem? No, you're like oh my god, I Charlie didn't Angel. never. Oh my god, ee, no, ee. no. Uh, anyway, well, she sang it. She probably okay. sang it wrong because she's a Charlie's angel. Maybe, I don't know. Anything you don't know. Maybe it was beautiful. Cheryl. Maybe it was Damn beautiful. it, Cheryl. Could you wrap up All the right. anthem, Cheryl? What else? Halftime show was. Uh, now remember, we talked about the '90s is when they started getting big bands. That's had, right. So the real bands. So this was this was just like marching bands and stuff. It was halftime show was up with people presents. Yes. a salute to the big band era. Oh, up with people. Yeah. I remember them. Do you? Yes, that's hysterical. I love that. So it was big band era stuff, and um, a couple things with the Super Bowl. John Madden did a pregame uh, guest speaking thing, yeah. like a commentating thing. Yeah. This was before John Madden had been a head coach. Okay, the big fat guy. Uh, I know and who he, he is. And he did so good as a pregame guest that they hired him to be a an analyst for the next year. Oh, and then, no. then he was years and forever. years of him being an analyst and and the Madden games and all that stuff. So he was later. never a player. He was a player. Oh, he was way back in the day. A long you know, time he was ago. A big fat line right. guy. Okay. And then he was a coach. Okay. He won a Super Bowl as a coach. Oh, okay. But only once. I oh, mean, he okay. only. And then he. Just quit then he playing. became a franchise. And then he got his video games. His and whole all that. thing was like yeah. an analyst, and everybody loved him. Go boom and saying all this crazy stuff. And okay, um, I think people love to hate him though, like like they do with Joe Buck and Chris Collinsworth. Everybody hates them. Yeah, a lot of people hated John Madden. Like I just remember people saying, "Shut the hell up, John Madden." Okay. Um, uh, but the cost of a Super Bowl ad in 1980. Do you want to give it a shot? I'm gonna say um, seven hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. You're you're way, way off. You're way off. All right. I mean, I want to divorce yourself. All right. What is it? Two hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. That's affordable. That is affordable. We we could afford us. No, we could not. <laughs> Almost. No. With the money we're making on this uh, podcast, we could make American timelines. Commercial. American timelines. Nineteen eighty Super Bowl. Go back in the future. You will enjoy it. 
something called a podcast. That's right. Watch a podcast. There's no people in 2018 that don't know what the fuck a That's podcast right. is. That's true. I keep telling my family, hey, will you listen to the podcast? What exactly is a podcast and how do I listen? Is it on? Is it on CBS? Uh, January 26th, Rapper's Delight became the oh, first. Oh, I love that. It became the first rap single to reach number one in Canada. It. I knew all the words when I was eight years old. To Rapper's Delight. But did you hear what I said? It never became number one in America. Oh. Well, see, my cousin, Katie, shout out. Yeah. Her. Katie Olson. Her mom had a fabulous album collection, and. She had She, she had, had the Rapper's Delight, and Katie and I would listen to it, and we memorized all the words, and we would sing. And a record? You and a play record. the record? It was the record. A hip, hop, a hip, a hip, a hip, a hip, a hip, hop, you don't stop for rocking. Um, you and ever they, been oh. over to your friend's house to eat and the food just ain't no good? The macaroni soggy, the peas all mush, and the chicken tastes like wood. <laughs> Here's the other thing about that song. You well, know how long that song is? It's long. They recorded that with one take. Wow. The whole that's thing. pretty impressive. They just went and did it. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool? impressive. Uh, yeah, so Rapper's Delight, I knew you would be excited about that. So yes, I am. I am. Even though it's not American, number one is a Canadian. It was a, it was a hit, though, I think. It was a hit. But February 16th, Do That To Me One More Time. Do that Captain to me one more time. Came number one. I can never you know with a man mm. like you. That's about sex. Yes, I know. By the way. <laughs> Thank you, um, Captain. That was included on the duo's 1979 studio album, Make Your Move, and it was written by Tony Tennille. Okay. Why are we talking about it if it was in 79? It was on the album in 79, but it became a number one hit. In oh, 19, okay. February okay. 16th, 1980. I see. So for about a week, it was number one. But Tony Tennille wrote it, and Captain didn't do shit. He just had a hat. Stupid Captain, idiot. Just had a hat. Yep. February 23rd, Crazy Little Thing Called Love is the number one hit. You know okay. Number one. Remember that? By Queen? Yep. Um, here's the cool thing about that song. Crazy little thing called love. Yeah. This thing. All right. What? First of all, Freddie Mercury wrote it in a bathtub. Did he? He sit in the bathtub when he wrote it. He wrote it in five or ten minutes. That's weird when grown men take baths. Well, Freddie, Mer- Freddie Mercury. That's true. He, of course, yeah. he takes a bath, yeah, you know? Uh, he probably has a bath that's like an olympic size swimming yeah. pool. Well, it's probably, I'm just picturing some kind of like fancy yeah. with the legs on it, you know, yeah. bathtub with the legs. But anyway, he, he actually wrote it on the guitar, too. So I don't, I don't know in why he had a guitar in the bathtub. Yeah. I guess it was an acoustic. But he doesn't play guitar. Like He's not known for playing. Oh, he yeah, really that's true. Play. So he said, it took me five or ten minutes to write the song. I did it on guitar, which I can't play for nuts. And in one way, it was quite a good thing because I was restricted, knowing only a few chords. And he said it was a tribute to Elvis Presley when he wrote it. Because it does sound like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely not a traditional Queen sound. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of their songs are so different. Yeah, they don't cool, have a that's why real... Great. Yeah. But so then once they would play them in concert, he would, Freddie would play a little bit of guitar. Okay. Because he wrote it like that. So yeah. I thought that was interesting. I love that song. Mm-hmm. But it was the first Queen song to get number one, to hit number oh, one was it? in the U.S. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm surprised. I guess that was before, like, Another One Bites the Dust and We Are the Champions and all that. Yeah. Another One Bites the Dust is the same Later. year we're going to get to Oh, it was the same year. Yep. February 27th, the 22nd Annual Grammy Awards. So we talked about who hosted them back yeah. then. This is funny because in 1980, Kenny Rogers hosted it. Nice. At Shrine Auditorium in L.A. It's before he looked like a 60-year-old woman. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. He still looked like my grandfather. Yeah. Uh, this year was notable for being the first year to have a designated category for rock music. That's the first year of first that? First year. Wow. Isn't that crazy? 1980? Yeah. And it's the last year there was a category for disco. Oh, yeah. Isn't that crazy? I think that would be funny to have a disco category now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, it might come back. That yeah. Bruno Mars sounds like disco to me. Yeah, that's true. I, they might. They, I bet they wouldn't call it disco, though. Do you want to guess who won the Grammy for Best Disco? The last Grammy for Best Disco? Diana Ross. Close. Let me guess. Donna Summer. Nope. Wait, let me you got guess. One more let chance. Me guess. Let me guess. Before Stephanie I Mills. I punch you in the face. Stephanie Mills. Are you going to just use your last guess that quickly? No. Shaka Khan. Nope. Is it a woman? Yeah. Glory Gaynor. Yes. Oh, nice. You got it. Nice. <laughs> you were really ready to guess that one. I know. It seems like you wanted to guess that way more than the horse. I did. Kentucky Derby Because I had horses. a clue. Um, cool. Album of the year went to Phil Ramone and Billy Joel for 52nd Street. Okay, yeah. You know, that's a great album. Yeah, it it's is a good album. It's got a lot of great songs. Mm-hmm. Song of the year went to... Kenny Loggins and Michael McDonald for taking it to the street. Is that right? No, no, no. Oh, Kenny, sorry. Kenny Loggins and Michael oh, McDonald. Oh shit! I don't know. What is it for? What a fool believes. What a fool believes. Yeah. You sound just like Kenny. I Loggins. do not. <laughs> yeah. You look like Kenny Loggins too. You do, you do. I probably do. I have a beard. Sometimes I look in the mirror. I'm like, you look like Kenny Loggins. Oh, paint. Kenny. How do I turn into Kenny Loggins? You know, March. We're jumping all the way to March twenty second. We're skipping a whole month. Good. Because that's because that Queen song was number one yeah. all that time. So March twenty second, nineteen eighty, new number one song by Pink Floyd. You want to guess the song? Dark Side of the Moon. 
Another brick in the oh, yeah. wall. That's a good dun, song. Dun. We don't need no. Yep. Burr, burr, burr. You know, it's three parts of that song. You know how it's yeah. It's sectioned up yeah. kind of thing. All three were written by their bassist. Okay. You know who that is? No. Roger Waters. I'm not a big Pink Floyd fan. You're not? Yeah, I never was either. What else? The Trix Rabbit. Yeah. Eight. Actually got to eat some Trix cereal. Oh. You know the situation? You know I thought you were going to say he ate one of the kids. No, he ate one of the kids, Because he was pissed yeah. at him for never giving his tricks. I always tricks. thought that was such a bad thing to teach a child that they can't, sh- like it's teaching them not to share. share. Yeah. We can't share with an animal. Why not? A cartoon animal. He's begging. Like he's starving. He's so skinny. Just give him some fucking tricks. I did always think about that. Like, what the fuck like, is the deal? Just give him the goddamn tricks. I know. And, and end it already. Seriously. Quit and being dicks. put my goddamn cartoon His back kids on. were dicks. Put Mr. T back on. I want seriously. Know. Put the Justice League back on. So please. do you, do you want to know like what led to him being able to eat the tricks? Was it was it a dystopian hellscape, futuristic kind of Close. situation? Close. Close. Um, actually, it was the second time, twice in 1976 and 1980, uh, that the rabbit got to eat the tricks because they did a, a top a box top mail in contest. Okay. Uh, entitled Let the Rabbit Eat Tricks and the kids could vote yes let the rabbit eat it or no don't let him eat it and mm-hmm. the results of the vote were overwhelmingly yes well yes because we were the Gen X the and, Generation X because we're nice kids yeah. we're nice kids and the, these goddamn millennials will be like no fuck the rabbit well now let's not Give alienate any candy. potential no, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just listeners here. millennials if you're listening this isn't for you. No, stop it. Stop. Well, actually, I am worried that millennials aren't going to like this. This won't appeal to them. They don't give a they shit about the 80s. They don't know the 80s, yeah. But now our, our crowd's going to get older. We're going to get yep. like 70-year-olds uh, like, how do I how do I work a podcast? That's What's it. a podcast? How do I get it? Is it on my phone? Where do we get is to the 1930s? There? That's going to really be. Is it just in my phone? Does it live in my phone? All right. What's next? April 5th of 1980. Mm-hmm. Randy Macho Man Savage oh, wins boy. the ICW Heavyweight Championship. You've been waiting for him. He defeated rugged. He defeated Ronnie Garvin, who they were in a feud with. So this 1980, Randy Savage wasn't even in the WWF yet. So he was new. He was new. New on the scene. He was a new wrestler because before, up until about closer to around this time, he was a baseball player. He played he for was? the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. Did he really? Yeah. He's a pro baseball player. Randy Poffo was a pro baseball player. Yep. What's his last name? Poffo. Oh, and he changed it. Well, his dad was Angelo Poffo, a famous wrestler, and his brother was Lanny Poffo. And okay. he changed his name because he wanted to earn his superstardom on his own. Okay. He didn't want Is this to according his... to his autobiography that you've memorized? No, I know everything <laughs> about Randy Savage because he's the greatest. He's just the greatest oh my of God. all time. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yes. Snap into a Slim Jim. Anyway, all right. April 19th, Call Me became the number one hit Call on me. Billboard's. Blondie. I love it. Love that. You love that song? I do love that song. Do you know it's from a, a, a movie? No. See, I didn't know that either. I thought you would have known this. Mm-mm. I thought you'd tell me this. No. It was the main theme song of the 1980 film American Gigolo. I remember that movie. You do? I mean, I didn't see it. It was a, a rated R, I believe. We should watch but it. But I remember it being, I remember it existing. The main character of the film is a male prostitute. Yeah. But the Italian disco producer Giorgio Moroder originally asked Stevie Nicks from Fleetwood Mac to do that song. Oh, really? Yeah, but she declined because she had signed a contract with Modern Records. Uh, I can't imagine Stevie Nicks' work. voice doing that. Yeah. Hey, Debbie Harry's voice is so good it, in that song. Well, it would have just been different. Yeah, totally song, different. Probably. Yeah. Because they said, sing that high. They said Stevie Nicks was going to compose it and, oh, I see. and perform it. So it would have probably have been, been a different, different song. song yeah. 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 April 21st, 1980, the Boston Marathon winner. Mm-hmm. Rosie Ruiz. Have you ever heard of this? No. I didn't know this happened either. The declared winner of the 1980 Boston Marathon, Rosie Ruiz, was later stripped of her title. Okay. After it was discovered that she snuck into the race a half mile before the finish line. Oh, my God. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, it's funny. Like, they all celebrated her. Yeah. You can look up her interviews with her passing the finish line. She pretended to be, like, T- out, exhausted like, so and exhausted, stuff. fall down. They carried her off and everything. Oh, sneaky. Isn't that great? Yes. So they later had to give it to whoever was after her. And they, uh, and a lot of people, <laughs> like, as they looked back at camera footage. Yeah, and they're like, wait a minute. She wasn't in the race Where anywhere is she? else. Uh, so she, that's Somebody same, lost their job probably that day. You would think, yeah, so. She later got in trouble for other fraud things too. But oh, really? Rosie Ruiz is a life, she's lifelong for. criminal. Yeah, that's a crazy story. May first, the Rubik's Cube. Oh yeah, was released in that, America. That fucking thing. It was a 3D combination puzzle invented in 1974. Oh, uh, but it wasn't available in the U.S. until 1980. I never in my life could even get one side of I, that goddamn thing. I can't do any of it. I mean, I don't get it. I at remember all. Be, being a kid, we 
Take people, up the stickers off. You can take stickers off, or we figure out how to wait. You can actually take rip the pieces, the pieces off, off yeah. and put it back on. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did that stupid. too. And it's like, why would you even have the toy if you're going to cheat? I, it's so dumb. It's not a toy. But, wait, but they That's had the thing. It's not a toy. They had them in all different shapes too. It wasn't just a cube. They had a, a, tri- oh, yeah. a pyramid. Right, they had yeah. a snake. They it's had not all a toy. Stuff. It's a frustration vehicle. It really it is. is. It's like piss your kids off. And well, then they show these people in there that in two minutes they'll sit there and get it solved. Well, that's even even under they say even under a worst case scenario you get it all crazy looking mm-hmm. no rubik's cube is farther than 20 moves from being solved they say uh, that's re- how that's bullshit you have to, your brain has to just work differently i think I, it's crazy and yeah. i don't even understand people that can solve rubik's cubes no yeah if, if you can solve a rubik's cube hats it's a, off don't you think it, it's a way to diagnose autism maybe or some kind <laughs> yeah, of like, I, I don't know if you can solve it you're you probably have autism yeah it could be or or they're things. geniuses or they're or, super geniuses yeah um Okay, May 3rd, the Kentucky Derby winner. Oh, Jesus Christ. Now you got to guess. Think of an 80s name. Um, Think. Um, two words. I don't know. Please don't make me guess that. Genuine Risk. That's not an 80s name. Well, Risk is a game. Do they always have to have two names? I don't know. It seems like it. Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit's one word, though, I guess. I don't know. But they seem like they always have two names. May 9th. The movie Friday the 13th came out. Oh, the first one. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yep. Did you know that um, originally the name for Jason was Josh? No. That doesn't <laughs> sound very <laughs> ominous. That's exactly it. They thought it sounded too nice. So yeah. they changed it to Jason after a school bully of the guy who starred Victor Miller. Oh, wow. That was funny. Um, uh, Bing Crosby's son, Harry, was in the movie. Did you know that? Really? I didn't know that. Did you know Kevin Bacon was in it? Of course. You, you did know that? No. Oh, he was. I did not, but that's, you know, that's one of the things. And do you know who auditioned for it and didn't get it? No. Sally Field. What? She auditioned She was for already f- pretty popular back then, wasn't she? In 1980? I don't know. Maybe, but she couldn't get in Friday the 13th. She was like in the Flighting Nun and stuff in the 70s, I think. I don't know. They didn't want her for that, apparently. Oh, wow. May 16th, the NBA championship, the Lakers beat the Sixers. Oh. You know either one of those teams? Anything about them? I, who cares? I know who Lakers cares? are Los Angeles, and they, you told me before they were originally Minnesota, Minnesota from that? the Great yeah. Lakes. So Magic Johnson was the MVP, and mm-hmm. I liked the Sixers at the time when I was a kid. I didn't care much about basketball because Where's Dr. Where's the Sixers J. from? Philadelphia, Philadelphia, 76ers. I loved Dr. J when I was a kid because okay. Julius Irving, Dr. J. I didn't okay. know anything else about him, but I think I liked him because J. You know, you're a little kid, and my name yeah, starts with J. Yeah, your name starts with J. So I love so, the letter J. Yeah. I was like four. It's like takes nothing more than that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I had a poster or something of him. But Dr. J. I love Dr. J. He's my favorite baseball player. He's Dr. J. <laughs> um, I need another hop slam. God. You go get me one? No. Okay, I'll do this next one, and then All right. hop slam. 18th of May, Mount St. Helens. Mm-hmm. Do you know about this? It erupted. Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18th, 1980. Mm-hmm. Photographer Robert Landsberg was documenting the changes in the volcano from just a few miles away, realizing that he couldn't possibly outrun the approaching oh, ash god. cloud. He kept shooting for as long as he could before using his body to preserve his film. Whoa! He managed to rewind the film back into its case, replace his camera in its bag, put the bag in its in his backpack, and then lay himself on top of the backpack in an attempt to protect its contents. Oh my god! And it died. Seventeen okay. days later, his body was found buried in the ash with his backpack underneath his body. Oh, my God. And the film could be developed and has provided geologists with valuable documentation of the historic eruption. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's nuts. That's fucking crazy, man. I wouldn't do that shit. I'd be like, fuck, I'm dying. Oh, shit. Everybody else is screwed. That guy was a dedicated man. Yep. Robert Landsberg. And that's why uh, we named our son after him. No, we did not. May 21st, Empire Strikes Back was released. Oh, yes. This was widely considered the best one, the greatest Star Wars movie of all time. Mm-hmm. I talked about last time, uh, Phantom length. Menace is, is widely regarded as the worst. Yep. This is the best. Everyone still thinks so. I think because, I like it the best. Why do you think it's the best? I think I like the storyline the best. I think you, they did it the best. You like the love like the, story the, between Han and well, Leia? Well, the, the, all of it. You know, like the characters were already developed because it's already been one movie. Mm-hmm. And so they, they. Usually sequels are terrible, though. Yeah, but this was, you could tell this was like an epic thing that it was going to go on and be, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's the best because they go, there's... There's so many cool scenes in yeah, it. Yeah, cool scenes. Like they start in the snow world. Yeah. If it was all in the snow world, 
Hoth, it probably would have been not Stupid. that great. Right. But they had a cool a bunch of snow scenes yeah. and the Tauntaun and the right away at the beginning Luke is in danger yeah, and all it's, this it's stuff. Fast and, then, fast. and then they go to a different fast. planet and yeah. there's the, the Luke versus Luke Darth Vader stuff. It's yeah, like, and Yoda, and, right? And the, comes in, the, yeah. in that one. Uh, or was he in the first one? Uh, he was in the first one, wasn't he? No, he was not in the first one. Oh, okay. Uh, Return of the Jedi is when he, he trains. Oh, it is. Okay, so. Or is Return of the Jedi when he comes back? Okay. Yeah, I guess he does go and meet Yoda, and that's when he starts training to be Yeah, Jedi. that's what I thought, and then he strikes back. God dang it. I can't remember. They oh, all run together for I know me. they do. And people, there's people screaming right now. Damn, Your brother really Andy's so, killing himself right now. And I love Star Wars. Yeah. Like, I'm a Star Wars fan, but I'm not a... I'm not a... Die hard. I'm not a crazy, like... Um, on Hoth, um, the, the timeline of Hoth. <laughs> Excuse uh, me. Began, um, in uh, scene forty-three <laughs> yeah. of uh, the Empire Strikes Back, um, you the, failed to mention. Yeah, I don't know that much of it, mm-hmm. but I love it all, and I I couldn't just name a scene and tell you no. where it's from. Dang it! When did that happen? All right. Okay, Return of the Jedi. He comes back and he's already trained. That's right, because he comes in all. That's why I thought Yoda he's was already in trained. Empire so Yoda's Strikes in Empire, and then yeah, that's right. Okay, it takes me a minute. I've been drinking, all right? right, and I'm old. What Screw else? you guys. Oh, so I have a little bit about Empire. Okay. James Earl Jones, mm-hmm. you know, yes. the voice of Darth Vader. Yes. He declined to have his name appear on the credits of both Star Wars Episode Four: oh. New Hope and Episode Five: Empire Strikes Back, claiming that he had felt his contribution wasn't significant enough to warrant oh, the wow. credit, even though he's like the greatest thing yeah. about everything. Yeah, he is. The 23rd of May, The Shining was released. Oh, what a good movie. We're watching that tonight. <laughs> After Tonight. this, we are All watching right. that. We're going to watch this. Okay, good. Because you have not seen it. I have. Not all. Of, I probably have seen it, but not. I'm making you watch it. such here, a good movie. Such a good movie. With any movie, whether I like it or not. You forget it. In two I forget days. it. So yeah. it's a benefit to me because I can see movies over and over. And it's like a new movie. Secret you of my are su- watching it I saw again Secret of My Success 45 me. times. That's sad. Okay, so to get Jack, Jack Nicholson in the right agitated mood in The Shining, he was only fed cheese sandwiches for two weeks, which he hates. Well, and Shelley Duvall was yeah. tormented. She was. Tormented by um, by Mar- uh, Martin Scorsese. No, who directed um, it? Martin Scorsese? No. No, the other guy. Uh, what's his name? Tip of my tongue. Um, I looked up the a other bunch big, of stuff about The him. other big director. Stanley Kubrick? Yes. Yeah. He tormented her. And he treated her very badly. Treated her awful. Yeah. And she almost had a nervous breakdown. Well, and her hair was falling out. Jack and, Nicholson's girlfriend at the time, I forget her name, and she's famous, but said that he would be so exhausted after filming, he would get get home from filming and just fall in the bed and fall right asleep immediately. Yeah, I bet. It took, uh, it took three days to film the Here's Johnny scene. Mm, gosh. They used over 60 doors. Oh, wow. They started out with like breakaway doors. Yeah. And because Jack Nicholson, he was a former uh, volunteer firefighter. So he was he, really going he full forward. Him, he busted him too easily. Yeah. So they had to get real doors. So it took him 60 doors to get that right. And, and they almost cut the who's, uh, Here's Johnny part. That Stanley was an ad lib? Co- uh, yeah, it was. And Stanley Cooper didn't know what Johnny Carson was. Like he didn't oh. get why he did it. Yeah. 24th of May, 1980, the Islanders won the Stanley Cup. Who cares? Who gives a shit about hockey? <laughs> May 31st, the top song, a new song on the number one charts, Lips, Inc. Oh. Funky Town, won't take you take me, me to, to Funky Town? Funky Town. That's right. Won't you take me to Funky, funky Town? So the only thing I have about that is um, the song was written while the band lived in Minneapolis with dreams of moving to New York. Oh. That's what Funky Town's supposed to be. Okay. They want to leave Minneapolis for New York because it was more funky than Minneapolis. Yeah, it sure is. I'm sure Minneapolis in 1980 wasn't very funky. No, nothing <laughs> funky. Yeah. Uh, Prince and Kirby Puckett were the only black people mm-hmm. there. Um, so that's not funky at all. And so on June 20th, yeah, the Blues Brothers movie came out. Oh, I love that movie. You love that movie? I thought you were still talking about the guy. So that's why I was like, what? No, that's on the Blues Brothers. So you have a June 20th thing. And I have a couple of Blues Brothers. So on the day of the Blues Brothers movie being released, mm-hmm. um, one thing happened while they were filming the Blues Brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, John Belushi was on a lot of drugs at the time. Yes. And uh, he once disappeared from the set. And mm-hmm. he was absent for hours. Mm-hmm. They had a limited time to shoot the scene, so all the crew began searching for him. Dan Aykroyd, who was wandering cluelessly in the night looking for John Belushi, followed an off-road path and came across a house with the lights still on, so he decided to try his luck and knocked on the door. 
A man opened, and right when Aykroyd was about to introduce himself to the man, the man casually asked, You're here for John Belushi, aren't you? <laughs> to which he added, He came in here an hour ago and raided my fridge. He's asleep on my couch. Oh, my gosh. Aykroyd would endlessly tease Belushi about that afterwards, calling him America's guest. <laughs> can you right. imagine if John Belushi showed up? Oh, my God, that'd be awesome. Start, you would just let him do yeah, whatever he wanted. Yeah, you'd let him do whatever he wanted. That's right. John Belushi? Holy shit. In the summer of 1980, yeah. there was a lot of mayhem going on in the city of Los Angeles. Um, in the year 1980, more than 1,200 homicides were committed in Los Angeles, and oh, 1,200. Yes, in the in the whole during the whole year, um, and there was many that were kind of particularly bizarre and gruesome. And um, the there was this pair of uh, sweethearts, psychopathic sort of sweethearts, um, called the Sunset Strip Killers. And this is the story of the Sunset Strip Killers: the Doug story. Clark and Carol Bundy. Hmm sound hot Just oh wait till you get a picture of carol bundy wait till you see this woman doug clark and carol bundy y'all. so um carol bundy was born uh in august of 1942 and mm. she suffered from very poor eyesight as from a from a childhood on like so thick, thick, thick glasses, thick glasses. They're very thick glasses that's how i like my ladies um, thick glasses. her father was an alcoholic they moved the family from town to town. Uh, her mother Trains was abusive out. to her and her sister. Then her mother died, and then her father started molesting Carol and her sister. So she had a pretty bad uh, time growing up. Yeah, that's not good. Um, it's not uh, ideal. It's not how you want to be raised. No. And by the age of 15, she was promiscuous with schoolmates and the school bus driver. So wow. that's bad. That bus driver. Um, you know. That's right. When she was 17. People to, think bus drivers can just do whatever they want. But, you know, you can't. You no, can't it's true. do it with the kids. Um, when she was 17, to get away from her father, she married a 56-year-old man. As you would. Yeah, but then she left him because he was drunk and he wanted her to, um, like, prostitute herself. And she, she wasn't up Wasn't going to do that. She was like, I'm tired of that. So then she meets this man named Richard Geis, who is 32, and he was a um, writer of pornography and science fiction. <laughs> Both? Yeah, both. Separately? Separately, I think. Maybe together <laughs> science sometimes. Science fiction and porn, but I do not combine mix them. the two. No, no science no. fiction porn. But incredibly, this was a healthier relationship than any of the others that she had. Yeah, sounds he, like a healthy... He um, encouraged her to write. She she liked writing, and he encouraged her to write. Oh, she even good. got a short story published in a magazine. Oh, well, look at the porn writer helping her out. And then in 1962, her father hung himself. And so then she kind of went through a crisis period, and she would fluctuate between men and women. She and Geis moved to Oregon, and she went to nursing school. He was cool with her doing it with I guess. People. she. I think there was just it, it, infidelity in general yeah. going on in there. I guess a porn, um, a porn writer. Yeah. Probably. So she went to nursing school in Oregon. You know, I think I could po write porn. I probably could write porn. All right. Then oh. um, she would still prostitute herself to other men for money, though. Um, but I thought she said no to the prostitution. That was when she was... With that other guy? Other she just guy. didn't want to do it for him, but she'd do it for herself. For herself, yeah. Okay. And so she, they break up. She, then she meets this other man, Grant Bundy, and marries him. And has two children with him. Oh. Um, but he she didn't have kids with the first one. No. These are our first two kids? Yeah. Then he, but he also abused her. And, God, and this got worse because her eyesight was getting worse and worse. And she got more dependent. And then he felt like he was having to care for the two kids and her. So he started beating the shit out of her. That's right. And so she... I feel like, I feel like this was way more prevalent then too. Yeah. Like back then, people just hit... Yeah, it was nor it was considered kids, yeah. okay or something. And then so in 1979 she took off with the kids and they oh, went they went to a shelter for abused women, um, and then she goes two weeks later and gets an apartment in Van Nuys, California. Van Nuys. Van Nuys. Sorry. Van Nuys. Van Nuys, California. That's okay. You um, can't be expected to know everything. I mean, that's right. Every once in a while, there's something that I know that you right. don't know. And I do Van know. Nuys I do know everything them. except for the stuff I don't know. You don't know anything about. Okay. Um, so Bill Lambeer. So. She moves to this apartment in Van Nuys, California, Van Nuys. and the the um, managers of the apartment complex where she moves yeah. is this married couple. Okay, and she, hot married couple, Jeanette and Jack Murray, and Ooh. she becomes infatuated with the husband, Jack Murray. Jack Murray, I know a guy named Jack Murray. Well, he um, was an Australian singer, aspiring singer. Not same guy. No, um, he came to America to make it as a singer from Australia. Okay, but, so he was in Men at Work, probably. No, no, no. The wife. Yep. Wasn't worried though. Jeanette Murray the was not worried. She didn't see her as a threat. No, because she was thirty-six, overweight. She Giant had glasses, real short brown hair, and these real thick glasses. Um, heavy gal. I, I ain't worried. Jack Murray's not gonna want to do with that. 
glasses have and heavy lady. Well, because even though the husband was known to philander, she he but like never with somebody with glasses. Well, that he like big. blondes and long legs and all this stuff. Not chubby glasses. But having um, <laughs> but he would go. You know, Carol was calling him all the time to come to her apartment, and fix things, and Try he would drive him. her to the social security office and doctor's appointments. And really? he convinced her that she could get her eyes fixed. Um, oh, and then he would do it because he would get those horrible glasses. Cause, right. I mean, I'm with him on this. Women with glasses are disgusting. So so she did go to a doctor and they said that they could f- correct some of her eyes, her vision oh, really? problems. And, her less, I mean, she still had to wear glasses, but she could actually, because right now she couldn't even she go couldn't become a nurse. She had gone to nursing school, but she couldn't oh. get a job because her eyes were so bad. So they can't, did end up fixing see. her glasses or fixing her eyes to the point where she was able to go, get a nursing job. She ends up seducing him, though. By the you know his third or fourth visit over, she follows him around everywhere. Um, She's then obsessing over him. Yes, she's following him around, and they but they did do it together. Yes, and he she gave him um, access to her bank account, and he was taking he was she was giving him money. She had this money. She had a twenty five thousand dollars settlement from the sale of her house with her ex husband. Oh, um, she gave him ten thousand dollars. She gave him ten thousand dollars. Is he yeah. manipulating her to do? This, I'm pretty or she's sure. Just wanting no, to do I'm, this? I think it's a little of both. Like she's she's kind of a doormat. You know, she does whatever anybody wants, and then she goes to Jack's wife Jeanette and offers her fifteen hundred dollars if she'll leave Jack. Fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, and Jack finds out he gets real pissed off, oh. um, and so she goes to this. There's this bar that she would go to that Jack would go sing at called Little Nashville, and um, in, in Van Nuys. Yeah, and she meets Doug Clark there, and it's instant. She goes to watch Jack sing. Yes. And then she's like, "Fuck, Jack! Look at Doug." Doug Clark, and he sees her sitting at the bar and sees what a target easy target she is oh, he's just after he's not like in love with her he's no just like, i'm gonna take advantage because she's by herself she's Giant real glasses. yeah she just does she she's looks like she lumpy. could really and so doug clark he was born in pennsylvania in 1948 and his father was in the navy and they would move around a lot and he was um so he went could travel the world hmm. um he was he had a privileged childhood um people that knew the family they didn't notice anything strange about them except that the parents whenever doug would get in trouble at school the parents would aggressively defend him hmm. um those kind of parents doug would um brag about sexual exploits with to his classmates that's normal and um Every dude does Doug's that. parents have been called to the school on uh, a number of occasions because of bad behavior, including drunkenness, uh, stealing a bicycle, writing an erotic letter to a female teacher. Um, despite yeah. that, and then yeah. he got expelled from school. But then later, when his parents were interviewed, they said there was never any signs of behavior problems with him as a child. The parents said that? Yeah. Because they were clearly in denial. That's They're right. defending everything. everything They're the kind does. of parents that he can't do any wrong. And, and that's blah, blah, probably blah. part of the, just the creation of the monster. Yeah. So then he goes. he's sent to a military academy. And he um, is obsessed with girls and sex, and he um, brings a girl to his room, and then he secretly records having sex, and then shows it to his classmates. Like a VHS? I think so it's audio. audio. Then he would take photos, secretly take photos somehow, and audio pa- recording, pass and them photos. around, and then pass those around school. Oh, so like he was, Polaroids, probably. yeah, probably. So then he um, graduates, and he goes to the military for a while, and he's discharged. Uh, then he moves to Van Nuys with his sister. And then he gets married, That's and it. so then he meet, meets and marries a woman named Beverly. Oh, um, hi, Beverly. She we'll she married. didn't say exactly what went wrong with their marriage. She just said he was real lazy. Um, well, that's and, typical. But she never, you know, he would wear her underwear. Well, sometimes is and that, is that frowned upon, Beverly? Even as a child, he would his mom caught him wearing her underwear before, it, at times. Mm. So that was, but the, wi- the this wife didn't think that was weird um, or that well, he wanted to try. I had other boyfriends that have worn my underwear. I mean, you know, it's me. Yeah. Underwear, you underwear. Mi casa, su casa with underwear. But also that he wanted to try wife swapping and three ways and stuff and she wasn't yeah, into it. So, well, yeah. um, you just gotta be, either you're up for that or you're not. So you she know. starts gaining more weight as Beverly they're married. Does. Yeah, and he starts it, spending Bev. less and less time at home. Um, Could you, just wait a while. He Jenny d- Craig? He drinks think? a lot. He um he, he, he can be angry when he's drunk, too. Oh, well, that's um, not good. No. Then their marriage ended in 1976. Oh, no, Doug. 1979, Doug begins to work at the Jurgens factory. Oh, so the Jurgens factory? So there's a natural place Doug to is, work if Doug you're... Doug is moving on up. Yeah, natural place to work if you like to 
Jerk off. Yep. <laughs> so I was thinking. All right. Jerkins. All right. So in f- then in February 1980, he set fire to his his own car outside the Jurgens factory to get insurance money. Oh yeah. So by the time he meets Carol, so now we're back to where he's meeting Carol at that bar. Back fast forward to the bar. So Doug and Carol's eyes meet. He has developed a talent for putting himself in the lives of these overweight and unattractive women. Is who, this 1980? Yeah. Who will give him the free rent and food and money, and all he needs to do is give him a little bit of attention. And then if they want more, then he just move, leaves them and moves That's on. That's all I've ever done. That's true. <laughs> they move in together very quickly after they meet. Well, because she's ready for something. She needs something. She needs something. But she's still maintaining her affair with this Jack Murray guy. Still, he's still going at it. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So there was, there. Carol and Doug's sex life was, had these very <sighs> bizarre sexual fantasies that were involved. He had this fantasy where he would capture this young girl and keep her as a slave and, um, they had a bondage thing and all this other stuff. So pretty soon he's like, you know, breaking down, he, he's desensitizing her to these to extreme fantasies uh, and he's getting worse and worse. And then he starts, he starts to suggest murder as being involved in the sexual fantasies. Uh, to, he starts having them include murder him murder somebody. and it would be fun to kill. And that any woman that really loved him would help him Ooh. kill somebody. And so oh, what's Carol saying about all this, she's, she's all right with it. She's opening up to She's it? She's opening up to it. That's right. They had this 11-year-old girl in the neighborhood. Oh, no. That well, what happened to her kids? What about her? She has two kids, right? They're there. These two boys are there. Oh, really? Her, living time. there, yeah. Oh, and there, there was this 11-year-old girl in the neighborhood that they would bring over and no, yeah, no. they were doing stuff. So anyway. Doing well, stuff to her, like tying her up and all that stuff? I don't know if it was that bad. They were taking pictures of her and stuff. So uh-huh. they, But it wasn't good. Whatever it Can was, it wasn't good. no pedophilia? I know. Just like I, no? I, I, I kind of graze over that part. <sighs> so she became aware that... Um, so one night he comes home and he's covered in blood <laughs> and there's blood on his jacket and in his teeth and all over his hands his teeth <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> don't worry it's just, I, I just it's just fell wine. it's just wine i fell on the sidewalk <laughs> no a little bit of blood on me don't so, notice it. well she probably didn't notice because you can't see anything right so she takes him to the bathroom she tells her boys to go back to bed then her, go back to bed honey daddy's got blood in his teeth then a week later it happens again or doug because he's not their dad no doug's got blood in his teeth again so a week later he's got more blood it in happens his teeth. again he comes back again and he does it yeah he tells her that he's killing and he killed another woman's boyfriend who had attacked him the week before like he said it was the same boyfriend he yeah. got in a fight with him one night and then the week later he says oh i killed the guy i had to kill him because he attacked me again yeah. and that's what he tells so um she tells she tells her kids that somebody tried to steal the car and that Doug heroically fought the attacker off and stuff. So she's yeah, she's telling them stories. So she also finds a duffel bag full of bloody clothes in the back of the car that they shared. Well, I got a duffel bag full of bloody clothes in the back of my car. Oh well, that's right. She she takes the bag of clothes to the laundromat and washes all of it. That was her Just to, like, kind of what she did. Out, yeah. I guess. She was the so I think she's starting to know. She's the cleaner. She's starting to Victor know. Victor the cleaner. Well, and Doug told her that he had been cruising down the Sunset Strip. Um, in the Buick on the afternoon of the June 11th okay. when he saw these two teenage girls that were sitting at a bus stop and he stopped and he tried to get him to get in but um, he wanted to get the blonde one to get in but she wouldn't go by herself so she and gets her friend to come with in. her blondes never get in by themselves so he he stopped the, the car in a parking lot and he shoot sh- he shot both of them he shot him mm-hmm. and then um, he sexually assaulted him and shot him and and then he <sighs> There was necrophilia involved as well. And we'll kind of graze over that topic necrophilia. too. Necrophilia. Yeah. That's when you have sex with a dead person. That's right. Those of you children listening. <laughs> that's right. That's when you have sex with a dead person. <laughs> that's necrophilia. So, so anyway, he confesses to Carol this whole story that he killed those two girls. And then it goes on the news, you know, that these bodies are found. Oh, no. And so she she kind of, she calls are the police. married at this point? No, they're boyfriend and girlfriend. They're just lovers. So she calls the police. And she doesn't say who she is, and she doesn't say who he is, but she says, my boyfriend, I think, killed those two girls. Um, can, I, can I get you to confirm some of the information that he told me? And then it gets disconnected, and she doesn't call back. So, There's no caller ID or call waiting nope. any, back then? I don't, yeah, I don't think the, the call was long enough for the, any kind of tap that would have been on it. 1980, you don't have yeah. nothing. Nobody has to do anything. So on Sunday, he... He drove her to a ravine where he cl- he dumped the the body of Marnette Corner, who was another sex worker he had picked up on the Sunset Strip. Then on June twentieth, the same day the Blues Brothers movie came out, that's when they had their first joint kill. So this is when he's finally talked her into killing so with him. He she's she now knows he's killing, even though she called the police. Yeah, it got disconnected, or she disconnected it. It's, or he it's disconnected. unclear because some so things be. I read said it was disconnected, but then the thing I was watching on the ID channel said that it she hung up. So it could have been her hanging out. It could have been him, like, unconnecting it. No, I don't think he ever found out that happened. Or he probably would have killed her. He would have killed her, He right? probably would have, yeah. So she probably just decided, I'm in it. 
I'm in it to win it. Yeah. I'm going to murder it. Yeah, I'm going to do it now. So on that same day that this, this June 20th, it's the same day the Blues Brothers movie came out. That's right. Oh. Also on June 20th, that night on television, mm-hmm. if they had been on the, right before they decided to do this, mm-hmm. they flip on the TV, there was a show on TV called 10 Speed and Brown Shoe. I remember that show. You do? Yes. It was a white guy and a black guy. You know who they were? I it, didn't know it this. Was, wait a minute. It was Jeff Goldblum. Yes. Oh, it was the black guy. It's the greatest black guy ever. Oh, gosh. I didn't know ben, this. Ben Vereen or ben something? Vereen. Was it really? It was Ben Vereen. Can you believe I remember that? I can't believe Jeff Goldblum and Ben Vereen were on a show and you didn't bother telling me. Can you believe that? Aren't you proud that I remember that? How do you remember that? I don't that? know. You are old. I do not know how I remember that. Ten Speed and Brown Shoe? Yes. You remember that. I do remember. I loved the show. So, I'm a little upset with you and I'm not Why sure our marriage <laughs> can continue because you've Why? gone through almost 20 years of being with Without me. Without telling you about Ten Speed and Brown Without Shoe? Without telling me about Ten Speed and Brown Shoe. Like, I mean, <laughs> just the fact that Jeff Goldblum and... And Ben Vereen were on a show together. I mean, yeah. all the times I talk about Ben Vereen, you couldn't have said he was on a show with Jeff Goldblum. No, I don't. Yeah. Every time Jeff Goldblum it was, was on one of those TV, things I thought about since you just mentioned it. Oh my God! Ten Speed and Brown Shoe was on that night. The same yep. night this happened. That's right. They had their first joint kill, so they pick up another sex worker who said her name was Kathy, and then they they shoot her and dump her in and some Friday, nearby bushes. June 20th, they pick up somebody yeah. named Kathy, and they shoot her and dump her in the bushes. Dump her, just dump her in the bushes. Well, I don't know what else was going on. They probably assaulted her too, but gross. All right, Good so then. Party. Um, the next day, Doug goes back to the strip and he tries to pick up th- on June twenty first. Yeah. Oh, that's the same day that Hulk Hogan defeated Angelo Gomez and Fred Marzino in a handicap match, that's and Hulk Hogan was a bad guy in nineteen eighty. Right, well, you told me that. So the next day, he was a bad guy wearing a gold a gold cape. With that's Freddy, stupid. Freddie, classy Freddie Blassie was his manager, uh, and and he he fought two guys and he beat them both. Jeez. They're two no-name guys. They were building him up as this big badass guy. Big so, badass. so he goes back to the strip and he tries to pick up these three sex workers who were who were there. Three sex workers. Three of them at the same time. Yeah, he's just getting bolder. And bolder he's getting going into. The, they call it a, the berserker mode when they start to get okay go crazy a little bit. So is this a seri- serial this killer? Is a serial killer because he's doing yeah he's a serial that, killer. These like, are serial killers, both he, of them, because they're living life in between these yes. things. It's not a right. mass snapping. Right. So she's not with him. That no, she's this not night. with him. So okay. this is Saturday. Yeah. So he can't get in any of them in the car. So he drives off, and then he comes back later, and then there's one there by herself, one of the oh, girls. It's easier to get her by herself. So he gets her, picks He's her up. A nice little Saturday. He kills her. He decapitates her. Then how does it does it say how do they kill him? They just shoot, shoot him. Shoot him. Yeah, he shoots they her. He decapitates her. her. Oh. He leaves the body in a in a car park, and then he puts it, her head on the floor of the back seat of his car. Um, and then he goes back. He starts he to the realize head in his car in the back the floor of the back seat yeah so he starts to head head home uh, and he realizes that her friends might be able to identify him so he goes back to where, kill them. where he picked her up and then one of the other friends is back so he he gets her to get into the car and they start driving around she doesn't even know that the head so, of her girlfriend is on the floor of the back of the uh, car that she's driving around with this guy what so he's what he wait they wouldn't get in the car with them when all three of them were there. I don't know why they did one oh, at a time. One at a time they will? Yeah, I don't know. Huh. So then he stops the car, pulls out his gun. Um, there's some. She starts screaming and these dogs in, the, in a nearby yard start barking because she's screaming. So he shoots her uh, and he takes her earrings, steals her cash, and then he pushes her out of the car, her body out of the car. Her dead body. Mm-hmm. So he, com- he goes home and he brings the head in and shows Carol. Here, his head that got... I killed yep. another lady, but I didn't keep here's her. The head. Here's the head. Here's the head. So she, they keep the head in the fridge, and she takes it out and puts makeup on it. And oh, he takes it what? in the shower with him. Like, just really gross. They're like, they've lost it. Now, they what are totally these sons doing it. during all this? I don't know. I, they don't mention the sons. He takes a shower with the head. Yeah, and she, God knows what's happening in there. And she put makeup she on puts it. makeup on it. She puts makeup on putting makeup on it. Then they go put are it in. Are they laughing about yeah, this? I think. Or just like, it must be. This is great? Then they put it in a box. And then they drop Are it. Are you sure this is all true? This is. They drop it off about a mile west of the Studio City Sizzler. So it, it's in a parking lot of the Sizzler. They just drop it off. In drop the it. It's in a box. Well, maybe the head just gonna hang out. The morning of June twenty seventh, Jonathan Caravello finds the box blocking his parking spot, and he's like, "Oh, here's a box. So oh, somebody left Jonathan me a present. Car- Do we know just some guy. Car- just some guy. Yeah, and he's like, "Hi, hey, somebody left this box in my spot. What's in the box? Oh, I what's wonder in what's box? in the box. So he opens what's it up. In the box? Yeah, he opens it up. You know what that's from? Seven. Oh, What's that's... in the box? What's in the box? All right. It's so he, head. he opens it up and he finds the head wrapped in a t-shirt and jeans. And so he calls the police. This head's got makeup on it and it was fucked in a shower. Well, no, I think they cleaned it off again. 
After the, oh, cleaned all the wiped all the makeup off. Yeah, They're they just wiped practicing. all they wiped all the any evidence off of it. She's I guess just trying to get a job at Macy's. It could be. So meanwhile, the relationship between Doug and Carol is deteriorating. Oh, it's deteriorating. It is. I would think it's getting stronger. So no, they. Um, He's Never going out more and more with other women. He doesn't oh. touch her anymore. They bicker all the time. He threatens to pack up and leave. Um, the only time he's interested in any sexual contact is if she brings over this 11-year-old girl. So, so uh, I know it's gross. So geez. they they do continue to go out cruising together, but they're not. They're finding it harder and harder to find when anyone to get in the car with them because word is starting to get around town there's that there's the couple. Sunset Strip murders um, of all these sex workers in the area. Uh. So Gosh. she calls her old friend Dick Geis. Remember him, the porn writer? He was a porn writer that encouraged her to write. Mm -hmm. right? So she calls him and she's Not the father upset. of her kids though, right? No. Okay. She calls him and she tells him about what's going on. And he oh, tries man. to convince her to call the police. But she doesn't. Uh, then she calls him back later. Did he ever write a porn based on this story? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> then she calls him back later and tells him, well, she's writing a story. And she was just testing to see how believable it was. That none of that was really true. Yeah. So then at her job, she starts making all these mistakes because she's working as a nurse this whole time. Oh, yeah. So she tries to kill herself by injecting herself with insulin in her car. And then the Doug has oh, called geez. the paramedics and all this stuff. So it's real dysfunctional. I mean, obviously, it's dysfunctional if they've got a head in if the refrigerator. Put, if you're putting makeup on a head <laughs> and then <laughs> taking the head to the shower, it's already nothing else gets be. Surprise. Yeah, that's right. So meanwhile, Doug has continued to murder sex workers. And sometimes he, he has sex with the corpses and stuff like that. So like you do. So anyway. Carol goes to visit Jack Murray, the guy that, the singer that she was oh, having an singer. affair with. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's where he met Doug. So she shows him the guns. There's guns in her car. She shows him the guns. She tells, tells him, him. about the murders. The murders. He tries to tell her to go to the police. She asks him what she should do. When he tells her she should go to the police, she starts to get scared. Because she was an accomplice, man. Well, and so she starts freaking out. Thinking later, oh God! What about her sons, where are they at? They, they don't mention them they're again. Just hanging out, playing Yahtzee. Yeah, they don't mention them again. Now they're playing Pac-Man. So she starts freaking out, thinking, oh God, he's going to tell on us. So she gets him. Oh, she's she gonna goes kill back him. to seduce him, try to get him in, her, in his van. Says, let's go out to the van. So he says, okay. They go out to the van. She kills him, shoots him. Oh, she cuts no. his head off. Jack Murray's head. You cuts his head off. Jack Murray's head now. Then she takes that with her. Puts makeup on it. Puts makeup on it. No, she, she doesn't. Make, no, okay. she doesn't. But then she picks. Then she goes and gets Doug from the Jurgens factory, and Doug. they they go and put drive the dumps go to a dumpster and put the head in a dumpster. Oh, let's go put this head in a dumpster, Doug. Yep. So now really the relationship is going can down you, the can tubes. You take a lunch break. I know uh, it's I hard to a, believe. I got a head. I got a head over here. I had to kill right. Jack Murray. Well, this is really hard to believe, but the relationship's really starting to go downhill now. See, I would think it's been with strength. No, throughout they, all these things. Doug starts getting freaked out that she he he's yelling at her that she shouldn't have killed Jack and that she probably left evidence and that there she's going to get him caught that she. <sighs> probably left shell casings in his him. van no so six days later after killing jack murray they go down to that little nashville club that they like to go to so what's the date now it's like july well let's see that was august 3rd so six days later would be 9th oh, august 9th okay. we already missed magic by olivia oh go ahead john coming <gasps> wait out. wait talk about that it's my favorite we missed all of july all right let's go back so we missed airplane airplane was released uh, july 2nd during all this yeah the 1980 comedy airplane remember that yes i love that um it was based on the 1957 drama Zero Hour. It follows the same plot, uses the same oh, character I didn't name, know that. and parodies numerous scenes, which I didn't know. So I can't imagine that being that funny, though. So uh, Billy Joel, ni July 19th, It's Still Rock and Roll to Me came out. That's a good song. That, I mean, that was number one. It became number one. Still Rock and Roll to Me. Um, so we missed that. Sorry. Caddyshack was released July 25th. Yeah. Um, and remember Caddyshack? Yes, I love Caddyshack. And remember the scene with the Baby Ruth candy bar? Yes. That was based on a true real-life incident that happened to Brian Doyle Murray at his nice. high school. Yeah. Somebody pooped in the pool. <laughs> somebody pooped in the pool, yeah. So it's, or I, maybe they threw the candy Didn't bar. Didn't you say that one time somebody said if you have three wishes and one of them was to poop in a pool? I I did that. I said that. That's what I'm saying. Didn't you say that once? I no, I had I was doing a, a stand up. That's what it was. A gig, and it was uh, you don't you don't. It's not. It was called funny on the fly. You just show oh, and up. you said one of your wishes would be to poop in a pool. No, it was just like what what's something you've never done that you wish you could do. Oh, and you said poop in a pool. Yeah, I've never done that, and I would like to just feel <laughs> what that's like. I just think there's pool. something wrong with you. Wouldn't you like to just no. know what it's like to poop in a pool? No, I don't want to swim around in my own poop. I don't want. I didn't say I want to swim around. Well, I just you'd have to be in, in the, the water with it. Well, I can get out after I poop. I just want to see what it's like to poop. While I'm, I'm watching underwater. you all summer in our pool. I'm gonna poop out there. I know you are. I do all kinds of stuff out there. Poop. All right. <laughs> Pee, cry, right. cry, cry. Yeah, barf. And August 2nd, 
Olivia Newton John's <gasps> Magic from the movie. I love that song. From the movie. Xanadu. From Xanadu. It was from the soundtrack. Oh, from me and Katie were all about Xanadu. We had the album. We had. Oh my God! Does this go? Matching Do you headbands. Believe in magic? No, that's no. not it. It's um, Do you believe no. Now I'm not gonna be able to think of it because you're singing. Magic. Um, it's um. I, don't think I know the song. Yeah, you do. I God, I yeah, I can't think of it now because you were th- singing. Magic. It's um. Abra. No, see, Abra-ca-dab. forget it because you keep singing, so I can't think of it. Magic by Olivia and John. I know it's, the other um, one. Physical. Mag- oh, Katie's gonna kill me. I know Xanadu, but I can't think of the tune right now. All the other songs are going in my head. I'll think of it. Do you know it was number one from August 2nd all the way to August 29th of 1980? That's pretty sweet. Like 27 days it was number one. That's a good song. And what day? I remember Katie um, had a friend oh. that was making her a compilation CD uh, back a long time ago with a bunch of songs. There was some friend in LA and she asked for contributions and that was the song I put. From, magic? Yeah, Magic from Louie and John. And Katie, she going? loved it. Oh, I'll think of it. Um, after killing Jack Murray six days later. So they go down to the little Nashville club that they like to go to. And Jack's wife, Jeanette, is looking for everywhere for him. She can't find him. She doesn't Where's know what's happening. Jack? So a block down the street, neighbors Where's have called police because there's this abandoned van and there's this stench coming out of the van. Because it's got to be filled with... That's where they cut up all the body parts. No, right? that's the van, Jack's van, that she killed him in. Oh. So his headless body's in the van. His body's just decomposing. Yeah, the so they police go down there and they find his headless body in the they van. they the head off? Like, what I guess that? so they can't be identified, I guess. You can still identify bodies I know. heads? I know. Well, they're crazy. Yeah, that's true. So... His word of his death reaches the people at the the saloon or the bar or whatever they call it, the little Nashville place. Yeah. Um, Jack sings. And people are wandering down the street to the van, and police are questioning them, and they start learning more about Jack, what kind of person he was. Um, Carol hears about it, and she goes hysterical, ex crying and carrying on, and she's in public in front of all these people. She's acting so like she's pretending. Pretending she's just, she's about just it. yes. But me both the both. So me thinks doth. Protest thinks, too much. Me thinks thou doth protest too much. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> say that five times fast. <laughs> so she, as soon as she can, though, she tells magic. She tells Doug to get rid of the guns. In, you know that that's gonna. Doug, get rid of the guns. So he leaves, and um, back at the bar, the police question all the customers and staff, and um, they start telling him. They start telling the police that Jack had mentioned that he was afraid that Carol had showed him guns in her car and that he had, was oh, afraid of her. Good thing he mentioned that. I know. So the next afternoon, Carol opens the door and there's two detectives at her house. Boom. So she says, oh, excuse me, I gotta go put some clothes on. I got a shower. There's one detective she, black and one white. And there's like ten, and, speed, uh, and ten speed so and brown shoe. Ten speed and brown shoe. throws on a house coat, goes to tell Doug. They take her down to the police station for questioning. Uh, Doug follows her there because he wants to control everything all the time. Oh, shit. Um, Doug in the hands. So he and Carol had already planned that this mutual alibi for the 3rd of August, the night Jack was killed. Right. They had planned it out what they were going to say. And they were going to say... They were going to say, well, Magic by Olivia and john is the number one song. And they were, that they were home in bed together that night is oh, what they were going to say. Doing it. So Carol changes the story slightly and says she had seen Jack earlier that day. Oh, no. And how Jack's treating her so badly and all the money he stole from her. and um, Jack? Yeah, that Jack she's telling the police oh. that, like, from right. back in the day when Jack took his, her money and stuff. Okay, yeah, right. So she does tell him she owns these two guns, but had sold them, and she gives the name a detailed description of the man who bought the guns, which is all bullshit, you know. Yeah. So they know there's something wrong with Carol and Doug's stories, and they... Um, Ain't adding up, Carol they, and Doug. They let them go, but they figure we're going to keep an eyeball out on these two. So We let these murderers go who chop somebody's head off. Right. The next day... will be fine, because it's at, 1980. Who cares? Well, the next day at work, Carol goes to work, and she... It's like she snaps. She confesses to two coworkers. Oh no! At work. That she kills this Jack guy. Yeah. So they run to the office and call the police. And then within minutes, all the f- upper floors of the building are sealed off, and the SWAT you know team's it. there and everything. But she slips through the basement and gets away. What? On the way home, she stops at the Jurgens factory to tell I, Doug. I better tell Doug. I messed she's, up. I told she's, some people. Yeah. So she tells Doug she's going to turn herself in. Doug, she get, she just, offers him her money. She says, "You get away. You go you and you do what ahead, you can Doug, do. Get away. I'll take the fall because really, yeah, you." Are more important but he decides he's got a better idea he thinks so he calls the detective and he says forget about what i said before carol and i weren't together the night jack was killed she went out i was home he's gonna pin it on he her is. that's right so um back at the apartment carol calls the police tells him of all the murders that she wants to turn herself and her boyfriend in and before she even hangs up, the police are already there because they know. They know. They know. They're after so her. they go and then they go to the factory at the same time arrest doug so they're both arrested 
At the Jergens factory. At the Jergens factory, Doug gets arrested. Where he burned his vehicle. That's right. So at the police station. I mean, he's a dedicated worker, though. I got to say, he, he stayed didn't, at the Jergens factory. He leave his shift throughout any of this. I no, I know. Keep making Jergens. Yep. So, um, <laughs> so. Uh, at so the police Jergens, station, Jergens could use this as an ad. They could, but how good it is to work there. So <laughs> well, she, our, our workers are are dedicated. Even if they've murdered a bunch of people, they yeah, they're still dedicated. Shift. So at, at the police station, in graphic detail, she describes the murders and how she's in, she was involved with Jack and put makeup and on the head and Doug's sexual fantasies and the, a head in the shower, the eleven year old girl, and Ugh. she confesses she really enjoyed the killings. Ugh. Um, so they they don't really know what glasses. to think about her. Well, because of the way she looks, and where do you see a picture of her? They're well, like the, looking at her like we have no idea. We've never seen anything like this woman. My favorite thing is when people have real bad eyesight and they have real thick glasses and you can't even like see their eyes. Uh, that's how hers are. I know, but I I love that. I don't know why I love that. You I love just that. get a kick out of that. <laughs> I can't really enjoy it. It's like it. Mr. Magoo. So Doug, um, they keep Doug in a holding cell and then they take him downtown and he's real arrogant and cocky and he's he's just blaming all of everything on Carol and Jack. He says, it's Carol and Jack that did all those killings. It wasn't, I wasn't oh, involved saying, at all. Now he's saying Jack. Did yeah. He says it wasn't me. She's blank. She's lying. It was Carol and Jack, but Jeanette, Jack's wife says, no, I was with him. She has an alibi for most of the m- nights of the murders. So that doesn't work. And then they also find more evidence at the apartment and the garage and in his car. And then they find the two guns at the Jurgens factory that he went and hid. They found the guns. Yep. So he's convicted on, so that's, do you have anything? Well, th- oh. this is just the very end. We'll go, and then we'll go back to August of 1980. What, what day were you at? I was just going to say in 1983, yeah. he's convicted and given the death penalty. Yep. Um, so he's still on death row to this day. Uh, he married a, another woman. You know, there's always these weird women that go and they fall in love with serial killers. Prisoners. Mm, yeah, prison serial killers. Conjugal visits and stuff. Yep. And, and he still says he's innocent and it was all Carol. So she withdrew her not guilty by reason of insanity plea and pleaded guilty to two charges of first degree murder. So she escaped the death penalty by doing that. She would continue to support Doug Clark in his fight to prove his innocence, even though he would continue to discredit her. So she was a doormat to the end. Yeah. And then in uh, December 9th, 2003, she died in prison of heart failure. And that's the story of the Sunset Strip Killers. Sunset Strip Killers. That was a crazy fucking ride. Yeah, it was a crazy, crazy fucking ride. <laughs> that was fucking crazy. <laughs> crazy and fucking the 80s, ride. It's just, I, I just think it's going to be a, a season of craziness. Crazy fucking rides. Crazy fucking shit. Like, and now we're not even done. See, we're trying to do a different format. Yeah, where Yeah, we're going to see we got the rest of the year because we stopped in August when all this shit went down in 1980. Yeah. We're trying this out. It's a little rocky, but. Yeah, so we'll just finish out the year. And, well, But it might cleanse the palate from some of this crazy ass shit. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh, it's just it's gross. Awful. The pedophilia stuff's gross. But it seems like 80 is just gonna be a lot crazier than the 90s were so we think that the world's so fucked up now it was really fucked up it was that's right uh so we left off at olivia newton john was during all that august 30th christopher cross sailing oh what an awful song becomes number one on august 30th till september 5th it was number one diana ross then took over the charts on september 6th with upside down oh i love that song Boy, you turn me. Yep. Do you know who wrote that song? Mm, Quincy Jones or somebody. Bernard Edwards and Nile Rogers. Why? The band Chic. Okay. Again, I, there they are. They've done everything. Yep. Um, you have to believe we are magic. There it is. Nothing can stand in our way. And if all your hearts survive, memory will arrive to make all your dreams alive tonight. That's it. September 23rd, Harley Race versus Bob Backlund. What? W- the WWF world champion, Bob Backlund, wrestled the NWA world champion, Harley Race. So that can't happen anymore. Like they. Okay. And even in the era, the Attitude Era, everything, the NWA champion would never fight the WWF champion. It was just, they were separate. It was unheard of. Yeah. John Bonham died on September 25th, the drummer for Led Zeppelin. Oh, okay. Mm. The inquest on October 27th of 1980 showed that in 24 hours, Bonham had consumed around 40 shots. Jeez. Uh, after which he vomited and choked. Alcohol him. poisoning. Well, he choked, he choked on his on vomit. His vomit. October 1st, 1980, Pac-Man was released in the U.S. Oh, fucking Pac-Man. And it was originally called Puck-Man. Was it really? But it was changed to avoid people changing it to Fuck-Man. Yeah, that was smart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> October 14th, the number one hit on the Billboard charts was now Another One Bites the Dust. Oh, there we go. And uh, they, Another One Bites the Dust, John Deacon's bass line was inspired by Good Times by the disco group yep. Chic. Chic. Same thing. Um, good Times, and you could see where that. Are. 
the good times. At the beginning of that, you could hear where yep. that would come from too. Same as as, uh, but also Michael Jackson attended a Queen concert mm-hmm. in Los Angeles, and mm-hmm. he suggested to Freddie Mercury that they should release that as a single. That's that another they, one that's bites why, the dust, and yeah, that's what they did. They released it. Yeah, um, October twenty first, the Philadelphia Phillies won the World Series. It's the first time for Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Uh, they beat the Royals in. Uh, four games to two games, and Mike Schmidt was the MVP. Our neighbor? Not Mike Schmitz. Oh, okay. Mike Schmidt. Okay. He had a mustache. Okay. October 25th, uh, Barbara Streisand's women, Woman in Love. I am a woman in oh, love, God, and I'll do anything. Barbara Streisand is just awful. Oh, my God. I'm telling. I'm sorry, Don McAllister. I'm telling Don McAllister that. You None said that. None of her music is good at all. I don't like any of it. November 15th. Lady by Kenny Rogers. It hits oh, number yeah. one. Yep. And do you know who wrote that song? Dolly Parton. It was number one from November fifteenth to December twenty sixth of nineteen eighty. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a live recording of Lady off his greatest. Well, who wrote it? Lionel Richie. Oh, sweet. Yeah, Lionel Richie wrote that. How cool is that? Yeah. November twenty first. Who shot Jr. Oh yeah. Are you familiar with all that? Yep. I am. It's a big who done it. Who shot JR? It was watched by 83 million people. I watched it. I probably watched it. I was allowed to watch Dallas. You were? We I had, had to go, go to bed. bed. I had to go to bed right after Dallas. We had to go to bed when Dallas came on. And then when I got older, I could watch that and found Concrest. We were allowed. It was Dukes of Hazard, then Incredible Hulk, then Dallas, then Falcon Crest. We went to bed after Incredible Hulk, and we had to. We all got to watch the beginning of Dallas because we were Cowboys fans in the yes. house at the time. So you could At see the this Dallas they Stadium. The Dallas Stadium. Okay, there's the Dallas Stadium. Now you have to go to bed. That's yep. what it was with us on Friday nights or whatever it was on. Friday um, nights, that's right. November 28th, Dukes of Hazard was another number one yes. show of 1980. Right. James Best left the show over a dispute over dressing rooms. Who was he, who did he play? He played Roscoe Pico. Oh, Trey. really? Coo, 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 coo. He left? He left the show for the remainder of the season oh. over a dressing room dispute. Um, and he was replaced by Huey Hogg, uh, oh. who was Boss Hogg's nephew. Uh, Did they get him back? Yeah, he came back. I was going to say. Year. December 8th, John Lennon was Oh, murdered. yeah, that was, was the other one. in 1980. That's John, right. We lost John Lennon. Yep. On the night of uh, Monday, December 8th, 1980, Lennon was shot dead by Mark David Chapman in the archway of the Dakota, his residence in New York City. Lennon had just returned from his record plant studio with his wife, Yoko Ono. After sustaining four major gunshot wounds, Lennon was pronounced dead on arrival at Roosevelt Hospital. At the hospital, personnel stated that nobody could have lived longer than a few minutes after sustaining such injuries. Shortly after local news stations reported Lennon's death, crowds gathered at Roosevelt Hospital and in front of the Dakota. Chapman pled guilty to the murder of Lennon and was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. He had remained in prison ever since, having been denied parole nine times. I think he's insane. Against his release after he became eligible in 2000. Yeah, he was a he was a big fan. He yeah. Loved, he loved John Lennon, so of course he's insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember, um, so I was four, and uh, I remember my mom was, yeah, my mom destroyed. was in love with John mm-hmm. Lennon. Like she... She got to. She jumped on stage with him one time at a Beatles concert. I mean, she was. I remember her being in tears, and I was just a little kid. Yeah, I wasn't in school yet, so she stayed home with me. And and when my mom was in tears, yeah, two two times my mom being in tears when I was little. When our dog Buckwheat died, and when John Lennon was murdered, huh. and uh, so I started crying. You start crying yeah. when your mom's crying. So yeah. I'm bawling, um, and so I get I get kind of choked up when I think about that. But, yeah, and when I think how peaceful and amazing he was and yeah you know, imagine it was a big loss that song it's it's crazy but, mm-hmm. uh, anyway december 12th stir crazy <laughs> came out <laughs> switching out gears same, same thing stir crazy came out i love that movie richard pryor gene wilder they they improvised most of the scenes you know that henry would probably enjoy that movie i don't think it's for kids i feel like i watched it richard pryor is not for kids i know but i feel like i watched it when i was his age you probably shouldn't have but there's then no again, way, yeah, there's no way it was on TV. Game. It was probably on TV with all and the they bleeps. bleeped it out. I mean, it's Richard Pryor. For yeah, God's sakes. that's true. Um, I bet it was. Did you know the Sidney Poitier directed that? Mm-mm. That's the first film by an African-American director to make a hundred, a hundred million. But Sidney Poitier directed it. Oh, that's cool. cool. I didn't know that. But Mm-mm. according to Greg Ferrara at Turner Classic Movies, 
Uh, Pryor was constantly late to the set, sometimes showing up at noon as much as four hours late. His probably body, doing it with Marlon Brando. Well, his, yeah, probably. His bodyguard later admitted to Pryor's agent, David Franklin, that Pryor was freebasing cocaine every night during the shoot. Uh, this made the star's behavior erratic and paranoid. December 19th, 9 to 5. I loved that movie. Came out. I've never seen it. Oh uh, my God! It's a it's a pretty good movie. And I, I I went to see it in the theater with really? my cousin Katie. I think it was with Katie. Well, and it's pretty good. It stands up. The three girls taking revenge on the male chauvinist pig. Uh, Dolly Parton accepted the role with the condition that she she would write and sing the theme song. And it's a great song. It was nominated for an Academy Award yeah. and won two Grammys. Yeah, that's right. She made the same deal for almost every other movie she did, yep. except for Steel Magnolias. And also, Dolly Parton has giant boobs. That, that the news flash. Yeah, she. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Dolly Parton's hot, man. She's still hot. Yeah. December twenty seventh. We're getting towards the end of nineteen eighty. The number one single took over from nine five was "Starting Over" by John Lennon. Yep, that was a good uh, song. After his, after his death. death. Yep, and that is the end of nineteen eighty because that's it. Ended up with John Lennon being the number one song. It, it, wow. And I think the wild world ride. was just like so. Yeah. Morning. heartbroken by him and yeah. his death and we lost an amazing guy but uh, so that's yeah 1980 is fucked up wild ride that's crazy huh yeah it's been a wild ride that was 1980 wild everybody 80s. thanks uh, if you're if you're sticking around on the journey with us for season 2 thank you for being here 1980 is going to get mo fucked up yes just goes downhill sure. from this so yep it's uh, time to get out of here Chuck Berry get the fuck out Chuck Berry